Welcome to our Candidates Forum for Chair of the Multnomah County Commission. It will last approximately 60 minutes. I'm your moderator, Debbie Kay, with the League of Women Voters of Portland. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that works to help citizens make informed choices in elections. We do not endorse any candidate or party, but rather we give voters the information they need to make informed choices. Membership information is available on our website and at the table at the back of the room. Also, we have voter registration cards. If you have moved, please uh, update your registration. We thank Neil Kelly Design and Paloma Clothing for their generous contributions to our education fund to make these forums possible. Today's forum is being recorded by Metro East Community Media, and we are grateful for their assistance. This is the third of six forums that the League of Women Voters is presenting before the May 20th primary. All forums will be available for on-demand viewing from a link on our website at lwvpdx.org. To view the forums on local access cable television, see the playback schedule posted on our website and also in your program. Voters can also look at our nonpartisan voters guide for answers to questions posed to all candidates, as well as a balanced presentation of the ballot measure. The voters guide is here in print form and on our website, lwvpdx.org. You will also find free copies at the Multnomah County Library branches in the Multnomah County Elections Office. Another important voter resource is housed at the Secretary of State's website. It is called OrStar and enables you to see the financial sources for campaigns, essentially to follow the money. Type O-R-E-S-T-A-R -E into your browser. Finally, to see information about the candidates and ballot measures that will appear on your ballot, go to vote411.org, enter your street address, and the voter's guide information for only those items on your ballot will appear. It is a fabulous resource. The candidates in today's forum are running in the May 20th primary election. There are two races. In the first race, you will be asked to vote for one among seven candidates to complete the unexpired term of the county chair, which continues through December of this year. In the second race, you will vote for one among six candidates for the four-year term of the county chair. James Rowell is running for only the unexpired term. If one candidate for the unexpired term receives 50% plus one votes in the primary, that candidate will be declared the winner. If no one receives more than 50% of the vote, the top two candidates will appear in a special election with a date to be determined. If one candidate for the regular term of county chair receives 50% plus one votes in the primary, that candidate will be declared the winner. If no one receives more than 50% of the vote, the top two candidates will appear on the November general election ballot. Everybody clear on that? If you have not yet registered to vote, the last day to do so is April 29th. Contact your county elections office or register online at voteoregon.org. Ballots will be mailed beginning April 30th. And now, onto our forum. Let me introduce the candidates for chair of the county commission. Seated in the order in which they will appear on the ballot, beginning at my left, are the candidates. Achilles Montas, Stephen Reynolds, James Rowell, Patty Burkett, Deborah Kafuri, excuse me, Kafuri, Wes Soderback, <laughs> and Jim Francisconi. In this forum, we have divided the group of seven candidates into two groups, one of four people and one of three people. We will rotate the candidates into and out of each group with each question, and the same candidate, therefore, will not always be the first to answer. The candidates have one minute to respond to each question. Members of the audience are invited to pose questions, write legibly on the cards that are distributed for that purpose. Hold your card up when you have a question and it will be collected. Timekeepers sitting in the front row, thank you very much, will signal a 15 second warning and then stop when the speaker's time has expired. And I have the gavel. <laughs> Let's begin. <laughs> the first question will start with Achilles Montas. What is your opinion of the county's emergency management system 
and how well does it coordinate with the management systems of the cities in the county? If it needs improvement, what do you recommend? I believe the county's uh, emergency system is working. Um, I will have to uh, gather more information since I'm a, an outsider now with the county itself to be able to have a better uh, understanding. But I believe uh, their response system is, is, is working and it's well. Thank you. Stephen Reynolds. I think, my name is Stephen Reynolds, I'm running for Multnomah County Chair. And I think that the emergency management system in the county is functional. I think it can do more and it can do better. Um, specifically in dealing with the most vulnerable citizens in the county, uh, especially those who are experiencing mental health crises. Uh, I would like, one of the things I would like to change about the system is to uh, increase the number of on-duty sheriff patrol cars and to partner more sheriffs with social workers so that they can be rapidly deployed to deal with people who are experiencing crises here in the county. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I haven't used the system. Um, as far as I know, it's working, but sometimes, like the other day, the police were looking for somebody and the notices didn't go out you know, for some reason. Uh, I, I really don't know much about them, you know, calling in and, you know, so I'm not. Anyway, thank you. Patty Burkett. Thank you. Um, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not as familiar with the emergency management system also. However, what little I do know about it, it's my understanding that every uh, entity does have its glitches and problems. However, I feel that they do make an, a concerted effort to make sure that everything is taken care of correctly. We'll have a, a different question that's related for the oh. next three people. The interim county chair has worked to develop an effective working relationship with Portland's mayor. How will you maintain that relationship and extend it to other mayors in the county? Thank you. Um, I think that's a great question, and I was very happy to see that Interim Chair Madrigal and Mayor Hales came to a agreement on the budget so quickly this year. I think they've really set the, a nice tone that I want to emulate when I'm elected Multnomah County Chair. I think it's incredibly important. People in our community don't know, nor do they care, who provides what service. They just want government to work and work well together. It is, um, I believe, my responsibility as the next county chair to make sure that I continue that great relationship with Mayor Hills and to ex um, really work to make East Mo the smaller cities in East Multnomah County feel like they're a part of the team as they are. Thank you. Wes Soderbeck? Uh, yes, it's Soderbeck. Pardon me, thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, I was all ready for the last question. <laughs> <laughs> The county has its own uh, mission, and it's not uh, a mission that it necessarily shares with the municipalities within it. They are uh, separate, have separate uh, duties. Excuse and me, I'm going to interrupt you. It seems your microphone is not working, uh, which is unfortunate, but if you would mind sharing and start over. Uh, Would you like to hear the question again? Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> the interim county chair has worked to develop an effective working relationship with Portland's mayor. How will you maintain that relationship and extend it to other mayors in the county? Uh, the word interim in there is interesting. That's a very short period of time. Uh, it will be a scramble for whoever uh, gets the interim term uh, to make peace with the, with the mayors of this county. Uh, I'm interested to see what happens on that. But it's like I was saying before, the county has its mission, uh, the municipalities have their mission, uh, and that's the way it is. Thank you. Jim Francisconi. You know, uh, I had the privilege of being a Portland City Commissioner for eight years, and it was the best job I ever had. But the county mission of taking care of those who are left out and left behind, I think, is more important, even more critical right now. I've met with uh, Mayor Hales, and I've also talked with Commissioner Salzman. So to answer your question, I think picking specific areas where we can help people 
who need help. So number one is uh, low income housing with wraparound support services and how we're going to advance that. Number two is public safety and how we're going to coordinate those efforts. Uh, number three is I know the city takes the lead on economic development efforts, but to make sure those efforts connect to our own people so that we increase wages and the ability of people to function. Those are kind of three specific areas, not to mention creating a regional bridge authority. I've also been privileged to have been endorsed by three of the smaller mayors, uh, the mayors of the smaller cities. And, and there, there's special needs in terms of they lack the tax base and support that the city of Portland does. So how we support them with parks, recreation, economic development efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will start with Stephen Reynolds. What changes would you recommend to rebalance spending between the city of Portland and the county with regard to social services? Well, I think the most important thing to to do first is to establish responsibilities and priorities within the county and to see where there's overlap in the services that the county and the city provides, whichever city it is in Multnomah County. Um, I think the cities in Multnomah County are better positioned to address and assess the needs of of their of their respective mis municipalities. Um, and in instances where the county and the city have significant overlap, the county should cede uh, and take a supportive role of the cities in providing those services. Thank you. James Rowell. Uh, there was a question about the city and the county working together. Like on the homelessness problem, the city built Bud Clark Commons for drug addicts and alcoholics, but yet none of them are going through treatment there. There's hundreds of calls every year to the place, uh, the, uh, and the county they want to work with the city hopefully who's ever in office comes up with some better ideas than what's being done for the homelessness you know just uh like right to dream nobody went from anywhere in the city like in Devers, uh neighborhood there was a church on Bidey that was going to have overnight uh let people sleep there they're homeless but yet the people in the neighborhood well, we don't want them there so uh, i don't know they just need to work better you know, watch how they spend the money. Thank you. Patty Burkett. Thank you. Oh, thank you, sorry. Um, excuse me. Uh, I went to the, um, my first real big event. Oh, thank you, Deborah. Thank you. <laughs> I better learn this job. <laughs> um, I went to the event on April 1st, which was about the homeless issues. And I appreciate that I got a little bit caught up because I'm very concerned about the homeless people and the people that have not very much. That being said, I think it's really important to share with mayor and with all the people involved that we need to have the public housing remanded back to Multnomah County, specifically because all of the county services that we provide to the home, uh, excuse me, the poor, the homeless, the indigent and the elders need to be protected. Now that being said, I feel it's very important, thank you, to uh, make sure that, you know, it's um, unfortunately the county is in chaos in my view based on what I know with regards to public housing particularly. Thank you. Deborah Kafuri. Thank you. Um, I believe very strongly that the city and the county need to work better together as was referenced in the last question and do believe that we're on that track and I'm really proud in fact to say that last week the city of Portland and uh, and Multnomah County commissioners right here at this very table voted in support of um, a plan moving forward called a home for everyone which lays out a um, governance structure between the city of Portland Multnomah County um, the city of Gresham and Home Forward, which will allow us to better coordinate and consolidate our homeless and housing services. Um, I've been working on this for the past two years and really am proud that we've got to the point where it's gone through, but now the real work starts. And I am um, have been having conversations with Charlie Mayor Hales before I had to quit my job in October to run for this position, but do believe that there are other areas um, around public safety, around um, mental health issue or how we provide mental health services in our community areas that the city and the county need to hammer out agreements on and I'm committed to doing that. Thank you. Thank you. A new question starting with Wes Soderbeck. Did I get that right? Yes. Good. A new county building was part of the education urban renewal district. If that district is abandoned, how will the building be funded? 
And which building was this? A county building that was going to be part a of the- A county building. Uh, which county building? A building that is, doesn't exist yet. It was going to be constructed as part of the Education Urban Renewal District down near Portland State. Oh. If that Urban Renewal District is abandoned, how would you propose to uh, fund the construction of that building? Uh, how am I going to construct a building that's not going to be there? It's not there yet. It was uh, proposed. Well, to house uh, county facilities. In fact, we're after after who's going to pay for it. Uh, the county is in a position right now where it is looking at some surpluses for the at this present spending rate for the next uh, couple of budget periods. It's also uh, the assessments are going up, so the tax monies are uh, uh, coming in. The assessments go up whether the property values go down or not. So there is going to be uh, money available to build a lot of things. That's where the money could come from. Thank you. Jim Francisconi. I'm not certain as to where, again, let me tell you, I'm, I don't have a plan as I sit here. Uh, the potential funding sources in addition to the county would be the university system as well as the city and having a conversation about kind of how that would happen and the priority list in terms of the county uh, assets, uh, the infrastructure needs. It would have to be part of that conversation. Thank you. Achilles Montas. I will uh, coordinate with the uh, Portland Public Schools um, <clears throat> because they have plenty of buildings that are available. So I will look into that option first. Uh, I, be, I think it will be more economical instead of uh, starting a building all from scratch. Uh, and I think it will be easier to find funding um, with the building that is already in existence from the Portland Public Schools. They got a lot of uh, extra buildings available. Thank you. We have a new question coming. What social services should be provided by the county to assist the victims of sex trafficking? Stephen Reynolds. Well, first and foremost, I think we need to have a safe place for these women and children, men, uh, to go to receive the, the counseling. Uh, I mean, they're going to require serious counseling and reintegration services, uh, similar to what you would provide to prisoners transitioning from jail or prisons. Um, job training and and housing would would be the number one, well, and two, and with counseling being the number three services, I would I would propose to provide to victims of sex trafficking. Thank you, James Rowell. Hi, uh, they should have a uh, safe place to go to after uh, they're picked up by the police, uh, sex victims, and we need to provide them with some counseling because they're probably gonna be mentally, well, you know, ruin them for a while, you know what I mean? They're, it's really sad, and, and the perpetrators and, and the Johns, you know, uh, they need to uh, be, uh, be held more uh, responsible. Uh, just I, I you go on the internet uh, that back page or Craigslist and all you see these ads for all these young girls and stuff I, I don't know and, and uh, the commissioner he wants to do away with the drug and vice division Wh who's gonna you know take care you know investigate these uh, sexual victims anyway thank you for listening Can I get that same question what social services should be provided by the county to assist the victims of sex, sex trafficking? Thank you. I believe the service is already in place, so I don't think that's particularly an issue. Uh, I do understand that there is a, a facility up in the Gateway District that helps uh, people that get uh, victimized, women, children. Uh, I believe this particular facility in Gateway is related to uh, victims of domestic violence. Uh, clearly, sex, tra sex trafficking also involves, a, I'm sure, an element of domestic violence. That being said, I feel that we need to make a concerted effort to assist people as much as possible, primarily because it's quite easy to find these people based upon criminal record activity. And so we'll have names and places and that sort of thing. 
That being said, regrettably, sex trafficking is a major problem around the world. And so we have people who are here, unfortunately, from around the world. Thank you. Deborah Kafuri. Thank you. Um, I do think that the county has made some great strides in this area uh, over the past um, four years, and that is thanks to the good work from Commissioner Diane McKeel, who's really led the effort here locally um, to ensure that we do have now a shelter for um, uh, young girls and, and boys who are sexually trafficked that's run in partnership with Janice Youth. And I think that is really the way to do it, to reach out to our community partners who are already providing these services and to make sure that they're adequately funded. Um, we also have partnerships with DHS, uh, the D District Attorney's Office. Really what these, um, what these girls need is, is housing, they need mental health um, and drug and alcohol counseling, but they need really specialty care because of the victimization that they've been through is so traumatic that um, they need to have special services that we do are lucky, lucky to have in this community. And I also want to commend um, this year's Multnomah County Commission because it's my understanding that it is in their ongoing funds in the budget this year um, as it was cr originally a one-time only um, offering. Thank you. Thank you. My order has gotten a little off, so you are excuse me while I jump around a little bit. So we'll start the next question with Jim Francisconi. What services should be provided to victims of domestic violence, including children? Well, and Commissioner Saltzman has uh, helped lead the way, uh, you know, at the city of Portland. Uh, so, I mean, it starts with uh, housing as well, very low income housing if, if is needed, but basically whatever is necessary to have happen whatever services is needed. It does start with housing. I also think that uh, mental health counseling is part of it. Uh, I do think uh, uh, drug and alcohol addiction, if needed, is helpful. But basically, we whatever is necessary needs to be provided. Um, but I think it does start with a safe place for people to be. Uh, there's a lot of also great programs that are, are focused on this, that the county needs to continue to support with funding. I also think part of it is employment services to help people. Uh, basically, it's whatever is necessary to help people uh, function and return to a normal life. Thank you. And the third, we'll have Stephen Reynolds. We'll get back to you. The uh, same question? Same question. What services should be provided to victims of domestic violence, including children? Well, a lot of the services are the same services that you would provide to the victims of sex trafficking, um, specifically s safe shelter. Uh, some of my earliest childhood memories are actually of doing volunteer work with my mother at, at a women's shelter. Um, and I don't know how many of those we have here in Multnomah County, or even if we do have any, um, but they certainly played a valuable role in, in assisting those women in their transition from an abusive relationship to a happy and healthy, productive life. Um, the things that they provided there were counseling and, and food and job training, um, public assistance if it's needed, uh, all the services that are required to help these women who, and in some cases men, transition their lives to, uh, towards happiness. Thank you. Uh, next question, starting with Aquiles Montas. How should the county's mental health services reduce the number of mentally ill who are incarcerated and address the needs of mentally ill persons in our jails? You repeat it again. Mm -hmm. How should the county's mental health services reduce the number of mentally ill who are incarcerated and address the needs of the mentally ill persons in our jails? And this is a great question and uh, something that the Multnomah County needs to be more involved also with the city and the, with the police. Uh, <coughs> that will be a way to definitely work with the, with the lawyers. There's a couple of organizations that are um, helping, uh, especially teenagers, and youngs to be able to um, to avoid some of the problems that they're getting into, uh, but definitely uh, we have to find out that it's more mentally related uh, through drugs. Uh, we also have to find out if it's through uh, being bipolar. So um, 
training, education, counseling. Thank you. Mr. Rowell. Well, you could start by stop arresting a bunch of them because they really haven't broken any laws. Oh, maybe somebody's urinated like that James Chassie. He ended up beat to death. Uh, uh, like this gentleman here, he suggested we need uh, more mental health people to ride along on the police calls and defuse the situations instead of using clubs or guns and stuff. And uh, what about the jail? Why not turn that into a mental health place? They closed Danish. Remember Danish? All those people got dumped on the streets here in Portland. And you can walk around and see the homeless. I live in Lentz. I see them living in the alleys. I see them walking down the streets. And so it's, it's a sad situation, and I just wish, you know, I don't know. I, I just wish you'd get some help, that's all. Thank you. Deborah Kafuri? Thank you. Our, it's, it's quite obvious that our mental health system is underfunded, and I think this results in people going to jail instead of getting the treatment that they need. Multnomah County currently spends over $16 million of, our, of its own general fund dollars in, in mental health because it is such a priority, but obviously it's not enough. And uh, there are some good programs that are, exist, like Project Respond, what, that partners mental health uh, providers with police officers so that when they come encounter with someone who's having a crisis on the street, there's somebody who's trained and knows how to defuse the situation. That's very important. We opened up the CATC, uh, the Crisis Assessment and Treatment Center on Grand Avenue, um, which houses for short periods of time people who are experiencing mental health crisis, and it's been very successful. But again, all these are not enough, and we see it with the number of people who we have in jail who are suffering with mental illness. The sheriff um, tells us that it's a huge um, amount of overtime spent on the suicide watch for these folks. And I hope to do something about it when I'm elected chair. Thank you. Wes Soderback. Uh, Wapato Jail was built but is not being used. Mental health patients are being jailed rather than treated. How should the commission approach these issues? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's the basis of my program. Open Wapato Jail. This is an ultra-modern system. I saw on television the other night one in New Jersey that's identical. Taking in low-level offenders and running them through a low-level system. Gets them off the street, they have to pay a penalty. We, are, uh, we have a system where we round people up and we try them and we throw them in the, in the jail and then the sheriff opens the back door and out they go, round and round they go. So, it's been suggested that uh, we use it for a uh, old folks home or a mental facility. That's possible, but it still doesn't uh, solve the jail problem. Now, the original question was what are you gonna do with the, uh, have people arrested with mental Ill illness. Don't arrest them. Unfortunately, there's no facilities for them to go to. Thank you. Uh, um, Jim Francisconi. Quick, quickly on Wapato, uh, you know, $300,000 a year, it's been sitting there, the taxpayers are paying for. There was a plan for drug and alcohol facility. That's what it should be, not mental health, drug and alcohol facility. That's what's needed. That's what should be done. I want to get back to your former question. I just visited the jail last week. It was one of the most heart-wrenching experiences I've ever had. About 60% of the people in, in the department, of, in the jail, are, mental Ill, are mentally ill, housed in conditions that are subhuman. It's not just my opinion. It's the deputy's opinion. The nurses there say, Said, do something about this. It's got to be dealt with. It it is so. It should have been. That's what's driving up the cost in the corrections budget and the sheriff's budget. So now we have an opportunity to do something about it. It's the Affordable Care Act. We have to use the money now and combine it. The county needs is estimated to have twenty million dollars savings from the Affordable Care Act that needs to stay in mental health. That means residential treatment, including Portland and Venice, where the county has not yet agreed to house people. It's peer-to-peer -peer counseling, but it's very low-income housing with wraparound services. This is, we need to deal with this. Thank you. Achilles Montas. 
Well, I also have spoken about the Wabato uh, Jail that it actually should be open for uh, be able to house the uh, homeless uh, and be able to uh, separate them and be able to provide services for them. That will be a good place for them to be uh, in one unit and not being shoveled around the um, neighborhoods that um, it will affect their neighborhood associations. Thank you. Our next question, what steps can the county commission take in the budgeting process to improve accountability in the sheriff's department? Beginning with James Wowell. Uh, what can we do to improve it? Uh, I think hiring a few more deputies like the jail, they get so much overtime. Some of them are, what, making $150,000, $200,000 a year. Uh, I, I, I see hiring more guards or uh, stop arresting a lot of these people for mental illness or, or small level crimes, uh, you know, like shoplifting and stuff. Uh, uh, just, it's like the fire department. They got how many chiefs and they're getting paid a lot of money and they're not going out on the calls and stuff. Maybe the, they're too top heavy in the, uh, the higher echelon of the sheriff's department. And uh, uh, I hope the problem gets taken care of, I don't know. Sorry, anyway. Yeah. Patty Burkett. Thank you. Um, could you please repeat the question? Certainly. Because I've got a lot on my mind, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what steps can the county commission take in the budgeting process mm -hmm. to improve accountability in the sheriff's department? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, uh, unfortunately, I have some bad news to share with everyone, and I think that this is important that the sheriff's department is even better funded. Uh, I don't think that it is a question of uh, the overtime, although I appreciate that. The bottom line is, is that they don't have enough people working for the sheriff's department to accommodate the number of people that they're dealing with on a daily basis. Now, the bad news I have, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, is that there is a, an individual that has been operating a business in St. John's on the corner of North Chicago and North Lombard. This individual is a wanted felon in Ohio. Thank you. And this is a very dangerous situation. I did speak to Sheriff, Sheriff Staten about this, and I spoke to the people in Ohio Parole and Probation, and today Ohio told me that that man is going to be on the national hotline by tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Uh, same question for Stephen Reynolds. What steps can the county commission take in the budgeting process to improve accountability in the sheriff's department? Well, I met with Sheriff Staten, and I asked him that question uh, because the situation with the overtime and the increased budget, uh, his hands are tied. The county commission negotiated contracts with the unions that allowed the deputies to basically game the system. They're doing shift swaps where um, you work for me, I'll work for you, we'll both get overtime, uh, allowing them to exploit the system. Another thing that they're doing is uh, the contracts allow them to work seven days a week. Uh, where I don't believe they should be allowed to work seven days a week in, in an effort especially to exploit the overtime system. Uh, those are two instances of where the county commission should have involved the sheriff in the negotiations because he assured me it wouldn't have, he wouldn't have allowed it to happen. Um, and it's a situation where, uh, where, like I've been saying, you need to involve the stakeholders. If, if you're going to have a discussion about something, all the stakeholders need to be involved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a related question, starting with Deborah Kafuri. When the county charter is reviewed in 2016, would you recommend that the position of sheriff become appointed by the county commission or remain elected? Please explain your answer. The first thing I'm gonna advocate for when the charter review commission comes up is that people don't have to quit their jobs to run for another one. Just, sorry. <laughs> 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 little levity, a little humor here. That's a little um, self-serving. <laughs> um, I haven't. I hadn't thought about it. I um, I know that the Charter Review Commission discussed this issue at the last go around and decided not to move forward. Um, and so I would first want to talk with people who served on that commission and find out what information they learned. I don't know that it's going to solve 
the problems of just changing from an elected to an appointed position. And I think it was gonna take relationships, building a better relationship with the sheriff's office, which is something that I'm committed to doing and in fact have the endorsement of the sheriff. I do believe that it's important, and I fought for this during my years on the county commission, to have a greater transparency in the, the entire budget um, the way it is, works right now at Multnomah County, it's really difficult unless you're the chair to have a, a hand in what the budget ultimately looks like, and it's really hard for the public to figure out what's going on. Thank you. Wes Soderbeck? Uh, well, if we go back, the charter before this charter that we're working on, we did have an appointed chair. Lee Brown was his name. Great guy. I met him several times. He had open house on Sunday. Anybody could go down and see him and talk to him. It was great. But then we had an upheaval in the county. Uh, the downtown interest decided that they needed a little tighter control, so they wrote this particular one. However, it was the people that decided that we need an elected sheriff. It's sort of an ancient deal. So we got people versus what probably would work the best. After you get so big, you need to have some restraint on the sheriff. And nobody is gonna run against the sheriff from the sheriff's department and take a chance of losing. Uh, I can live with it either way. If I had a chance to vote on it, I'd vote for elected sheriff. Thank you. Jim Francisconi. You know, regarding the excuse me, I'm appointed chair. Excuse me. <laughs> regarding the charter commission, I actually uh, do think that uh, people shouldn't have to resign their seats to run, and I also don't think that appointing your successor so is the right way to do it either. So I think both of those issues need to be addressed. In terms of the sheriff and the elected position of the sheriff, I didn't get to answer the previous question. I do think the first step is talking to the sheriff about the budget and how and making sure that the financial tools are available to the sheriff and to the whole commission to get at the uh, cost issues uh, and I think that is the first step uh, and also integrating parole and probation with the sheriff in, a, in a, using a data system I do think though that if those conversations are not productive the county and the board has the ability to more closely regulate uh, the the budget for the despite the elected nature and you know I know at the city of Portland you have an appointed police chief but I know that the city council exercises a lot more and so that would be the process for looking at it before getting to very difficult to uh, you know appoint sheriffs thank you and Achilles Montas I believe it's also um, to be appointed uh, just have a uh, through a commissioner uh, review a citizens review so there'll be no favoritism uh, on who uh, who's a popular person thank you we're now going to take questions from the audience and thank you all for writing legibly I'm going to get back on my uh, order here and so this question will start with Wes Soderbeck the chair is a special powerful unique role how will you approach working with and leading the rest of the commission? Well, I used to call the chair an uh, imperial chair. Uh, somewhat of an exaggeration. The chair has one vote. The commission has four votes. It's not, it's not, a, you're not a complete dictator. Uh, so uh, the... Uh, Duties are set forth in the charter, and they're quite clear. Uh, the commission doesn't have a whole lot to do. Uh, show up on Thursdays, and, and, and that's their main m mandate. What they do on their own time is, is apparently their own. They can uh, meet together in the back room and do whatever they want to. Uh, so uh, I don't see the... Uh, uh, chair's job is, is ne necessarily a, a leader of policy as much as an implementer of the policy uh, that the uh, commission uh, sets forth. Thank you. Mr. Francisco. You know, 
you know, I'm very aware that this is an executive job. It's the CEO of the county. It's not a legislative job. And so I'm very aware of that. But I also know, given the history here at Multnomah County and appropriate leadership in general, that the chair has a special responsibility to build a team of people of all the the county commissioners so they're included including earlier in the budget process i also think it's essential to build a team of the uh, department directors uh, to help execute with more strategic plans more performance measures more audits of than, than it's been happening here but i also think it's really critical to also involve the workers who actually deliver the services in a concerted effort and so it is the county chair's responsibility uh, to do all of that and uh, th that's what i'm committing to do that's the only way any organization but one as important as multnomah county can function and deliver the services that are essential to our residents thank you Achilles montas and i follow up with um, what jim had to say um, working in collaboration with them uh, to get the best results uh, from everybody, so uh, we'll be able to get inputs from not only the commissioners, but also the employees, and to be able to implement the, the decisions. Thank you. Stephen Reynolds. I disagree with Jim here. I don't think that this is a, an executive sort of position. The Multnomah County Chair is a leader, uh, and as a leader, uh, of and Multnomah County Chair, I, I will use my position to set priorities within the county and within the com county commission, uh, and use and use that authority to delegate to those best able to execute the priorities that are decided upon. Um, and I would be sure to in to make the the whole de in the entire decision making process inclusive of all the stakeholders, including the county commission and local community leaders. Thank you. Uh, the next question, which is related, starting with James Rowell. What can the county chair do that a regular commissioner cannot, and what limits are there on the chair that are not on regular commissioners? I'm, I'm not certain what the county chairman does. Uh, I guess they're head of the meetings, you know, meetings call to order, you know, and stuff. Uh, I, I think we need new leadership in the uh, office, that's why I'm running, because it's, I don't know, we just need new leadership. We need new names, new faces, new ideas, you know? Instead of the same, last 20 years, we're getting the same deal. You know, look at the Selwood Bridge. It's being built, but Clackamas County, they're the ones who use most of it most of the time. How come they're not paying for it? We could put up a couple toll booths and have have them pay their fair share, you know. Just uh, or the Morrison Bridge County knew it was bad workmanship, but went ahead and used it anyway. So, I think we need better people. I, a new face, new name. Thank you. Thank you, Patty Burkett. Thank you. Could you please repeat the question? What can me? the county chair do that a regular commissioner cannot? And what limits are there on the chair that are not on the commissioners? Well, the uh, county chair is, in fact, the executive of the county. So that is the title of the chair. That being said, uh, I believe that uh, it's quite important for the chair to um, uh, certainly consider things in a very nonpartisan way, and I think that's extremely important. The chair has the ability, it's my understanding, to override a lot of different issues and legislation that is presented to the chair. That I may be incorrect in some of that, but it's my understanding that there's been a lot of uh, interesting activity going on with about real estate around town. So clearly, uh, there are things that can be done at the chair level that uh, puts people in a very uncomfortable position. Thank you. I'm sorry, go ahead. Excuse me. I thought your thank you was that you yeah, were finished. No, if you go right ahead. Finished, continue. Uh, no, that's okay. You go right ahead. Thank you. Pardon me. No, that's okay. Deborah Kafuri. Thank you. 
Um, the chair of Multnomah County is in the CEO of the county government, which is very different from the way the structure at the city of Portland with the, the mayor and the commissioners. Um, I believe the most important thing is to make sure that you have a really strong working relationship with the commissioners, because while the chair does have authority that the commissioners don't have in terms of hiring and firing of staff and um, signing contracts, uh, presenting the budget, really to get things done and to get things done in a productive way, you need to have your support of the you need to have the support of the commissioners, and that's why I'm really proud that three of the four city and commissioners and the interim chair, Marisa Madrigal, have all endorsed my campaign for Multnomah County Chair. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we will move into closing statements. Each uh, candidate has one minute, and we will begin with Aquiles Montas. Uh, again, my name is Aquiles Montas, 36-year uh, Portland resident. I lived in North Portland, my house, for 30 years. Uh, I have experience working with uh, public funding and also private. I also own my own uh, restaurant from scratch. So that's one of the uh, my big uh, decisions to run because I believe the county needs to have a financial officer that it can handle uh, decisions that are more important and be able to prioritize what are the needs of the city according to what the citizens are needs. Thank you, Stephen Thank Reynolds. You. My name is Stephen Reynolds. I'm running for Multnomah County Chair. And I'm really running because I think our, our alternatives in this race, um, they've had the opportunity to affect policy here in Multnomah County for much of the past 20 years. And here in, here in Multnomah County, um, our joblessness, it lags Oregon, which in turn lags the rest of the nation. There's just an article released in the Oregonian today where uh, we have one of the most dire situations when it comes to th to uh, our low income and unemployed populations. Um, and I think that it's not an indictment of, of my opponents, it's an indictment of their ideas and their lack of ideas and the stasis and status quo that is set it in here in, in Multnomah County. Uh, and I think that a new face with new ideas um, and new leadership is what we need. Thank you, my name is Stephen Cody Reynolds. Hi, I'm running for office, and I, I'm running for office, and um, I thought the election process is fair, but it isn't. If you look at the news, TV, radio, uh, and uh, newspapers, it's just about Jim and Deborah. No, no, are we going into Tribune, the Comeback Kid? Co you know, it, they don't ever ask us. The, a question, you know, each week the Willamette Weekly ask questions, would you cut business taxes? How come the rest of us aren't included in this? We have ideas and stuff, we're just as qualified as they are, you know, so they, we, we haven't been in public office, don't mean we couldn't get the job done, and they talk about the homelessness. Jim and Deborah raised, what, almost a million bucks? Why don't they use that money to support 150 families and pay the rent for a year? Uh, and just by building homes, I mean, apartments, you're not going to get rid of the homeless problem. It's always going to be there. The people are going to keep coming from all over the country. Thank you. Patty Burkett. Thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, I very much appreciate being here because I am a citizen candidate and I literally can relate to every single demographic, demographic rather, in the county. I have experienced homelessness myself. I am a military veteran, I might add, and I'm not quite an expert, but I'm a sharpshooter. And uh, I also feel very strongly that it takes a good leader. I feel very strongly about my leadership potential. I've been a leader many times over throughout my life and my career. I have received accolades. I have many people that I've spoken to during the course of this event that uh, I've not necessarily talked to a lot of people lately, but I do talk a lot of citizens. And I've talked to thousands of citizens, and they're very proud of the fact that not only am I willing to do this job, but I'm willing to do it and not take any donations whatsoever, and also donate 25% of the chair's salary to charity when I'm elected, and maybe more. Thank you. Deborah Kafuri. 
Thank you. Thank you all for coming today and thank you for putting together this forum. Um, I would be honored to serve as your next Multnomah County Chair and I respectfully ask for your vote. I'm very proud of the work that I've done over the past five years in the Multnomah County Commission working to get homeless families off the streets and into housing without using a shelter system, building the Selwood Bridge, which was a project um, long, long overdue, and working to find creative solutions to problems in our community. And I offer those to you um, as I move forward in this campaign. And these are reasons why progressive groups representing seniors, nurses, women, working families, the environment, including Governor Barbara Roberts and former County Chair Bev Stein have endorsed my candidacy. And it's my hope that you will join them um, on May 20th and please don't forget to vote. Thanks. Wes Soderbeck. I've spent uh, the majority of my life as a manager and a supervisor. I'm a uh, war veteran of both the uh, submarine service and uh, the merchant marine. I traveled extensively. Uh, my family is a pioneer family, not only in Oregon, but also in North Dakota. My uh, grandfather settled up a, a homestead in the Hillsdale area. Uh, the house I live in is built in 1875. I'm the third or fourth generation to live in that house. I know Multnomah County, uh, and it would be an honor uh, to be uh, chair of Multnomah County. Thank you. Jim Francisconi. I think that, uh, that the people I care the most about over my life have been those people left out and, le and left behind, and we're leaving a whole lot of people behind. Poverty has almost doubled in Multnomah County in the last 11 years. So it is true, and your questions here were great ones, and thank the League of Women Voters. The safety net needs to be the county. No one else will do it if the county doesn't do it. But I believe with the right leadership, the county can also be a vehicle to help people get out of poverty. And that means partnering with our schools and our teachers. It means more job training. It means fighting the fight to help increase living wage jobs for our families and people. That's, I would be a, an honor, a deep honor to be your chair of Multnomah County. This is a tremendous organization and we need it now more than ever because of this growing gap between rich and poor. So I can list my endorsements. You can find them on jimfrancisconi.com, and I would be honored to earn your vote and to be part of an effort that's eluded us to close this gap between rich and poor. Thank you. This concludes the Multnomah County Commission Chair Forum. We thank all the candidates for participating in our forum. Thank you. Thanks also to our timekeepers and volunteers from the Portland and East Multnomah County Leagues. Please check our website, lwvpdx.org, to view all of our forums on demand and for replay dates, times, and channels for local access cable television. Pick up the League of Women Voters Voters Guide here and at your local public library. Online, check uh, vote411.org for a preview of your personal ballot. Election Day is May 20th. As in all Oregon elections, you will receive a mail-in ballot. Ballots must be mailed back early or delivered to an official drop-off site anywhere in Oregon by 8 p.m. on Tuesday, May 20th. Postcar postmarks do not count. This is Debbie Kay for the League of Women Voters. Thank you for watching. Please be an informed voter, and remember, your vote counts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.